Today is April the 24th. Welcome to the Personal Computer Show. I'm Hank Key and my colleague is Joe King. Do you know who has your personal data? Do you know how Facebook, Google, and Amazon are using your personal data? Is that product you bought from Amazon a counterfeit? You should find out. Our website is pcradioshow.org. We can be heard each Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on prn.fm, streaming on the Internet, as well as on various podcasting hosting sites. Podcasts of the program is available on prn.fm, on the Internet, and pcradioshow.org. To listen to the live program on the telephone each Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, the number is 641-793-7091. For those who are listening to the program on demand, you can leave us a message with your question or comment to hank at pcradioshow.org. You can also reach us on the Google number 862-800-6805. That's 862-800-6805. And you start your message with the Personal Computer Show, followed by your message. When is a PDF file not a PDF file? The Mueller Report When Special Counsel Robert Mueller released his report on Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, it was in PDF format. I had wanted to read about any references to this Steele dossier. The released PDF file cannot be extracted nor searched. Many others also noticed that they couldn't search for any text on the pages. The PDF Association published a long explanation of why the Mueller report was, well, presented in very poor format. It starts with some basic facts. The 448-page document doesn't conform to archival standards. It was produced on April the 17th on probably a typical office network copier printer, and it uses lossy compression, more appropriate to photographs than to text. The Justice Department might have gotten a high-quality PDF from Mueller, printed it, and rescanned it, or Mueller might have delivered a paper report that the department scanned and released. Rescanning makes absolutely sure there's no inappropriate text data released, limiting people to the words they can see and the black redacted boxes, but it inflates the file size and makes the text unsearchable unless people run it through their own optical character recognition software, a process that won't be as accurate as scanning the original source file. The PDF Association post notes that an untagged and unsearchable PDF could violate the Justice Department's accessibility rules for people with disabilities. PDFs preserve the original text and formatting of a document. They can include clear redaction, and they are supported by many platforms the association just isn't too happy about the document. Well, a searchable version of the redacted Mueller report can be obtained from the Washingtontonian.com website. Just use the following search words. Washingtontonian Mueller report. And by the way, the word count on dossier came out to exactly one. Bloomberg News reported on the rising trend of con artists portraying themselves as medical professionals while offering residents of low-income communities a few bucks in exchange for a DNA swab and some personal health information. In some cases, the perpetrators have even placed advertisements on Facebook offering free cancer screenings. The scammers use their victims' insurance and personal information to file bogus Medicaid reimbursement claims. They are exploiting your medical needs in an attempt to take in illegal profits. The information could also be used to steal victims' identities, leaving you saddled with a debt. The con artists falsely represented themselves as being affiliated with Passport Health Plan, a medical insurer. They, for instance, appeared to have no paperwork to prove that they were actually affiliated with Passport. In a statement to Bloomberg News, The insurance company said it was in no way affiliated with this activity. Scammers are also targeting residents of senior living communities. Bloomberg reported 
The con artists were approaching seniors at assistant living facilities, offering to swab their cheeks for genetic material purported for DNA checks for cancer. There is a screenshot of a Facebook post for free cancer screening that offered $20 for anyone with passport insurance. You should, however, rely on the advice of your primary care physician and not someone you don't know. Charter Communications, which runs Spectrum, and the New York Public Service Commission reached an agreement in their long-running feud over expansion of the company's Spectrum network that includes an additional $12 million to finance high-speed internet expansion in the state. That's what we said all along. It all comes down to money. In actuality, the agreement will cost Charter more than $600 million, doubling the original cost of its required expansion in the state as a result of its 2016 purchase of Time Warner Cable. The proposed agreement will allow the parties to move forward with the critical work of expanding access to broadband. In July, the Public Service Commission voted to revoke Charter's license to operate in the state after the PSC found that Charter had violated the terms of 2016 acquisition of Time Warner's cable New York operations. Under the PSC's approval of the deal, Charter was required to expand its Spectrum cable TV and internet network to 145,000 potential customers in areas of the state lacking high-speed internet service. The PSC had claimed that Charter was misleading the Commission about its progress on the expansion and including addresses that already had high-speed internet available, such as in New York City. Charter, however, denied the accusations. The PSC voted on July the 27th last year to revoke its approval of the Charter Time Warner cable deal and order Charter to come up with a six-month plan to exit the state and have someone else run the Spectrum operation. That's not realistic, and we knew that. However, the two sides have been in negotiation since right after the vote to try to keep Charter operating in the state. This past Friday, terms of the settlement were filed with the Public Service Commission, which must still approve the terms. The deal sets Charter's current network expansion at 64,827 passings, which means how many new addresses its network can now reach. The company has until September the 30th, 2021 to reach 145,000 addresses. The original cost of the Charter expansion was estimated at $305 million, but with more stringent requirements outlined in the deal, the expansion will probably double that. As a result of this agreement, the department estimates that Charter will need to spend more than two times the amount originally estimated by the Commission as the public benefit of the network expansion condition and will bring high-speed broadband to more than 145,000 homes and businesses in upstate New York. Charter will also set up a $6 million fund that it will use to pay for additional expansion in its network beyond 145,000 addresses. It will also set up a second $6 million fund that the state will use to fund additional broadband internet expansion across the state by Charter and other companies. And all this is being settled with an announcement that there's been a decrease in population in New York State. We'll see how this turns out. New York City's internal wireless network that crashed earlier this month has over the last decade morphed into a nearly $900 million expense. Northrop Grumman was tapped in 2006 to build and run the New York City wireless network, also known as NYC Win. The global defense contractor has racked up $891 million in payments off an initial five-year deal and two renewals. This includes at least $55 million in an unanticipated cost overruns that the city agreed to pay Northrop Grumman for construction work and services not included in the original agreements. The city's Department of Information Technology and Telecommunication plans to extend the contract another year through mid-June 2020, a move that will likely cost taxpayers at least $40 million. 
Despite pouring a fortune into a cellular antenna infrastructure created to help agencies control traffic lights, license plate readers used by the police and other key functions, the city still found itself vulnerable earlier this month. NYC winds suffered an embarrassing and entirely preventable crash that lasted 10 days. Only a year earlier, the federal government issued a warning that a time counter rollover event could affect GPS-enabled devices like NYC Wind. Yet neither Northrop Grumman nor the city tech department took the necessary precautions. GPS was originally designed to timestamp signals using a system that counts weeks using a 10-digit field that tops out at 1024 weeks. That comes out to 19.7 years. It expresses the time of a signal sent by satellite in weeks and seconds into the week. For a few reasons, a GPS receiver on the ground has to take that signal and calculate the current date as part of the processes that it uses to determine location. Once that 10-digit field in legacy GPS devices fills up, it resets to zero, and that could cause problems. The U.S. Naval Observatory released an alert on the issue in 2017 and warned that GPS receivers' month-year conversion could fail and that incorrect time tags could corrupt navigation data at the system level. A recent memo from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security explained that a nanosecond error in GPS time can equate to one foot of position ranging error. Of course, an error of 19.7 years has the potential to make navigation data completely useless. This was like a sort of a mini Y2K bug for GPS receivers that will come into effect from April 6th of this year. Well, that was April 6th, two weeks ago. The city and Northrop Grumman could have potentially avoided the software crash. Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications planned to transition city agencies over faster, cheaper wireless service to be provided by commercial carriers like Verizon. The savings would be $30 million annually. The agency is in the process of switching over to a system that will utilize cellular carriers. Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications would be operating a pilot program with several agencies using commercial cellular carriers, but declined to say which agencies and carriers would be involved and what would it cost taxpayers. When it comes to cord cutting, the objective is to reduce the cost for cable television reception. Television packages provided by standard cable providers are oversized, and there is no option to reduce the bundle size other than receiving basic services. For many, it is to drop the television option from the cable providers and subscribe for television channel reception on the Internet. Many years ago, Aerial, created by Chet Kanogia, was a technology company based in New York City that allowed subscribers to view live and time-shifted streams of over-the-air television on Internet-connected devices. The service opened to customers in March 2012. On June the 25th, 2014, the Supreme Court ruled against Aereo in a case brought by several broadcast networks. The court found that Aereo infringed upon the rights of copyright holders. Aereo's services were suspended on June the 28th, and the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on November 21st, 2014. Five years later, Chet Kanogia dusted himself off and raised even more money to challenge an even more powerful business. Kanogia's new company, called Starry, has an intriguing offer. Ditch your internet provider and replace it with a faster and cheaper connection, all while receiving top-notch customer service. The company places a small antenna on a tall nearby building, and if you sign up, you get a small in-house box that serves as a modem and router. The upfront cost is a scant $50. The company has been operating in its home city of Boston since 2016 and says it can deliver a hyper-fast stream of 200 megabits per second to any urban residence under any weather conditions. Kenogia adds that Starry's connection is 99 plus percent reliable. Given its Wi-Fi only offering, 
the company's marketing at cord cutters, the growing cohort of people who have no cable and watch all their entertainment online. Starry has raised $163 million and is now live in five cities, Boston, New York, Denver, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C., and building out in 17 others. The push into these major centers, especially New York, will be a test of the service's viability and show whether a startup can muscle onto turf that now belongs to Comcast and Verizon. Starry also disclosed plans last year to expand to 18 other cities. Nearly 31 million Americans have never paid for cable TV. For years, there has been a question about how many people have never paid for a traditional pay TV subscription like cable TV. Now, a new study from MRS Simmons has reported how many people have decided that cable TV just isn't worth it. According to MRI Simmons, 31 million Americans, or about 12% of all adult Americans, have never paid for a traditional pay TV. According to the study, the average never cable age is 33, with an average household income of 52800 in 2018, which is a 27% jump since 2017, when the average income was 41500 Young people used to say that as soon as they got their first well-paying job, they would sign up for the full suite of traditional TV services. Today, there are many more options for connecting to TV content. So, competition for these subscription dollars is fierce. As they grow in numbers and wealth, today's cord nevers definitely represent an opportunity for content providers, but understanding the nevers' underlying motivation is essential to targeting them effectively. These numbers are likely to be close, but it's very hard to know exactly how many cord nevers there are. There is no easy way to track them like you can with Americans who drop a pay TV service. How do you track someone not paying for something? So the cord never group could even be larger than 31 million. Now add in the number of Americans who cancel cable TV, and you could be looking at the number of cord cutters to be over 40 million Americans. A public Wi-Fi network is a place you never expose any personal information. This is especially important when it comes to the need to enter a password for any particular site. Case in point is an Android app that has been exposed as a leak of stored passwords as they are stored in a plain text database. Thousands of users of an app called Wi-Fi Finder, the stated purpose of which is obviously to locate and provide credentials for public Wi-Fi hotspots, had inadvertently submitted their own home Wi-Fi passwords to the app database, which has now been leaked online. Ted Crunch reported on Monday that the app, which appears to be based in China, has been used by over 100,000 people to collect more than 2 million Wi-Fi passwords globally. The database includes network names like the SSID, precise geolocation, and plain text passwords, among other data. The app enables users to upload lists of stored Wi-Fi passwords, but it has no mechanism to differentiate between public hotspots and home networks. Thousands of users in the United States alone apparently failed to notice this, to say nothing of the app developer's obvious failures. The database itself was discovered by a security researcher and a member of the GDI Foundation. Eventually, cloud host DigitalOcean stepped in and took the database offline. While the potential consequences of this is extreme, they are likely minimized by the fact that attackers would need to individually target the households contained in the database. This is thanks to the geolocation data exposed by the database. Hypothetically, an attacker could use the credentials to fiddle with router settings, intercept logins, spread malware across a network, and take over smart home devices such as security cameras. Career cyber criminals would likely find this process tedious, but what is horrifying is the knowledge that so many people are continuing to download apps developed by companies no one's ever heard of, granting them access to all sorts of personal information about themselves and others. Downloading Wi-Fi Finder, for example, required users to surrender access to their locations, full contact lists, meaning phone numbers and email accounts of all their friends and family members, 
and in some cases their birthdays and social media profiles as well, for no particular reason. The ability to read, modify, and delete data on their phones. If you didn't already know, do not use apps that demand these permissions. Google Play itself continues to be one of the easiest ways to quickly spread malware to the incompetent masses. Researchers in January, for instance, found 9 million Android owners had been infected by dozens of malicious apps. A month earlier, another group of researchers found 22 apps downloaded more than 2 million times that secretly open tiny browser windows and repeatedly click on ads, draining users' batteries, and just last month, Google deleted some 200 apps infected with adware that had been downloaded nearly 150 million times, and the list goes on. You should be particularly skeptical when a service is offered to you free of charge. If a random person offered to fix the brakes on your car for free, you would probably say, hell no. No different than unlocking your phone and handing it to a stranger at the mall. It only takes a quick scan of Wi-Fi finders to realize the likelihood of something going wrong is very high. Need we say any more than just exercise an extra ounce of common sense? Microsoft is closing its ebook store and they're taking the books with it. Even the ones you bought and paid for. Microsoft is closing down its ebooks platform. All books will be deleted from the giant's cloud, including ones purchased by users by July 2019. Those purchases will be met with a full refund with a bonus $25 credit if you actually use the annotations within the book software prior to April 2, 2019. Meant exclusively for the Microsoft Edge browser, which has only 4.4% share of the browser market. The closure marks Microsoft's third attempt to enter the ebook market. The first began in the year 2000 before ePrint, when MS Reader tried to sell books for LCD screens. In 2011, the company put the really updated software out to pasture. The next year, they tried again paying $300 million to invest in and partner with Barnes & Noble's Nook division. However, nothing much came of the deal. It was dissolved a mere two years later with Barnes & Noble buying out Microsoft. The closure of Edge's e-reader marks Microsoft's third failed reader program of this decade. It also highlights the increased vulnerability of property in a streaming age. The idea of a bookstore proprietor entering your home and taking your books because their store has closed down, it makes no sense. Yet, that is the risk that you take when trusting their media completely to streaming. It's a risk Microsoft customers had seen before with streaming music. It's unclear if Microsoft will make another attempt at an ebook market. For now, the online marketplace gets one seller shorter, while independent bookstores seem to have created a sustained moment of success. Benjamin Rockwell will be presenting the first of a five-part series on tech support. This is Benjamin Rockwell, and I've been an IT professional for a long time now. I'm here to impart my knowledge from both sides of the technical experience to make your life better, easier, and to help you challenge your technology problems. Now, this is a five-part series that I'm starting right now. This is part one, and it's all about technical support and working it better to your advantage. Now, I've spent years calling technical support. No, wait, let me be a little bit more specific. I've spent years on hold waiting for technical support. I've also spent years helping people as tech support. And even now, I answer calls regularly, helping people figure out whatever computer problem they have. So let's lay out this five-part series. Part one, which we're covering this week, is an introduction to the characters in this grand drama. Part two, next week, is preparing for your call. There are things you should be doing first, things that you should get ready for 
before your call. Part three, making the call. There are a lot of tips that I'm going to give you on making the call and working this all to your advantage, working the experience in such a way that you get to your goal, which is getting your computer fixed. Part four is after that, the following week, which is escalations. And we're talking about escalations the right way. Not the screaming and yelling and saying, I want your manager now. No, I've got the way to do that too. And part five, after the call. Yes, there are things to do after the call. So let's dive in here with this week's. This this is actually kind of the simpler one, but I want you to understand the characters that play out in this entire scene before you. The different folks that you are going to meet or you may meet on this phone call. First and foremost, I want to give you a warning. A warning to keep calm throughout the entire call. You remember that old adage that you get more flies with honey than with vinegar? All right, I want you to be nice. I want you to be friendly. And by all means, if you slip up, I want you to apologize right then and there. Your demeanor is being noted. And if you're hostile, you'll be escalated to someone who is equally hostile. And that, that, my friends, is counterproductive to your needs. They will permanently mark you down as the troublemaker. And that's bad. All right. Who does that? Okay, I'm going to call this one the bruiser. This isn't the first person you're going to meet, but I'm going to tell you who you don't want to meet. This person, the bruiser, is the one that says, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. He is with the mafia. He is seven feet, three inches tall. He's got a shaved head like I do, but he is three feet wider than I am. If you have a major problem, call anyway. You may wind up there accidentally, but the goal is to avoid him ahead of time. Now, the people you want to talk with, the people that you will meet along the way, the script reader. Now, this is hopefully self-explanatory. This is the technician who doesn't know how to troubleshoot, but he has very specific guidelines that he has to go by. No, He doesn't know how to process information critically. He will pass you along as needed. However, your goal is tier two, not the bruiser. Again, script reader, they're just going to say, have you rebooted your system yet? Have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done this? Have you done that? And they stick to that script. It's hard to get them off of the script. Tier two technician. This person has been a script reader, but they have expressed a genuine knowledge of the material. They've been working with this for quite a while. They know how to think outside of the script. They have a desire to fix. Yeah, they fail sometimes, but they're working. They're trying their best to make the experience move a little bit better. Tier three technician. Now, now we're getting somewhere. This person either wrote the script or they were consulted during authorship. You will spend maybe an hour getting to them. And if it's simple troubleshooting, they're going to hate you. You do not want to climb your way on up to the tier three tech and ignore tier one and tier two. You want to give tier one the script reader, and tier two, a chance to fix things. If you've exhausted those levels appropriately, properly, if you've gone through all of the different questions, this person right here, the tier three tech, will love your challenge. Then, of course, there's the supervisors. Yes, there's a pencil pusher at every level. This person can be a bruiser or a bonus. The bruiser you already know. The bonus is someone who you can reason with gently, who you can schmooze and use to get the person on the line who will solve your problem. All right. This is somebody who can help you if you're good. 
if you're nice. And we'll be talking about that when we get into the call later on in the series. Now, the VIP, that's the very last one in this list. If you ever get this high and you do it nicely, you will be in a position where you're going to be puzzled. You will also puzzle the vice president, the CEO, or whoever it is, into wondering why you weren't cared for in the first place. This gets you onto a special list, which gives you VIP status on future calls, if handled properly. Next week, we're going to cover how do you prepare for the call. There's a lot of stuff, and that'll be coming up again next week. This is Benjamin Rockwell. Back to you, Hank. Thank you, Benjamin. Windows 10, April 2019, is a major overhaul of Windows 10. Let's get to it, and let's find out what's in it. Windows is slower after April 2019 updates, according to many users. Users are reporting that after installing the April 2019 Patch Tuesday updates, Windows has suddenly become slow, and programs are taking forever to open. The issues that users are experiencing include... Windows taking a long time to start or reboot, unable to start programs, lag in games, excessive disk activity, video streaming issues, and other similar problems. There is a conflict between the latest Windows updates and Sophos, Avast, and Navero antivirus software that is causing Windows to freeze or updates not to finish installing. What are some of the major overhaul updates that are featured in 2019. There's a Windows Sandbox. Any software installed in Windows Sandbox stays only in the Sandbox and cannot affect your host. Once Windows Sandbox is closed, all the software with all its files and state are permanently deleted. How can this feature be of asset to you? Simple. You can download files in the Sandbox and then when the downloads are finished, What you can then do is write those files out to an external media, and then when it's closed, whatever may be good or bad will be deleted. Of course, before you close it, you could also test the software in the sandbox. What else is new? Well, there's a new start menu. The Windows 10 May 2019 update will introduce a simplified default start layout for new devices. Search and Cortana have been separated. Windows 10 Reserve Storage While not a new feature per se, it is worth noting the May 2019 update will reserve around 7 gigabytes of storage or more to ensure critical OS functions always have access to disk space. Users will not be able to remove the reserve space from Windows 10. Reserve Storage will be introduced automatically on devices that come with version 1903 pre-installed or those where 1903 was clean installed. You don't need to set anything up. This process will automatically run in the background. Then Windows 10 May 2019 updates will be able to remove buggy updates to the point where they may prevent a PC from booting up in a proper fashion. Essentially, if the software is unable to start up as normal, it will check to see if any recent updates may have been responsible. If this is the case, The software will uninstall, and updates in question will prevent them from being added again for 30 days. Windows 10 will also show a message that reads, We removed some recent installed updates to recover your device from startup failure, if this process has taken place. Another new feature is that you really don't need to safely remove a USB flash drive anymore. And many of us, we probably don't even wait for the operation to finish, we just yank out the flash drive. You know how every tech expert in your life told you how crucially important it was to safely eject a flash drive before ripping it out of your PC? Have you been that tech expert yourself? Well, Microsoft is confirming once and for all that in Windows 10, it's no longer a thing you need to worry about. Windows 10 has a feature called Quick Removal that lets you yank a drive out anytime so long as you're not actively writing files to it. It now is the default setting for each new drive you plug in as of Windows 10, and that goes back to 1809, so if you have 1903, it's in it. 
Basically, it's a quick removal that keeps Windows from continuously trying to write to a flash drive, which could help in the event you disconnect it. Technically, Microsoft flipped the switch back in October when version 1809 first started rolling out, so it won't be a revelation for any of the listeners. It just so happens to be making the rounds now that Microsoft is notifying IT professionals that the update is being deployed more broadly. Plus, the company's had protection to keep your flash drive safe since Windows 7. But it's also true that Microsoft has been sending mixed messages about the need to safely remove drives for a while, and the operating system definitely still features a safely remove hardware and eject media feature. USB storage devices will be easier to remove, but will become slower. That's the price you pay for this feature. Microsoft has modified the way Windows 10 handles the operation of disconnecting a USB or Thunderbolt storage device. This includes USB thumb drives, external hard drives, flash drives, and even USB data transfer connections established between PCs and smartphones. Why does all this matter? Well, until now, the default policy in all previous Windows version when disconnecting a USB storage device was the better performance setting. Starting with Windows 10 version 1809, this became quick removal. The difference between the two is significance. Better performance means that Windows manages data transfers and storage operations in a manner that improves performance. This includes caching data while it's being transferred, open, or in preparation for certain operations. This constant readiness on Windows' part meant that any user who wanted to disconnect a USB or Thunderbolt connected storage device had to go through the safely remove hardware process, which meant triggering a manual eject. All Windows users know the procedure. But with Windows 10 version 1809, the default state for all USB and Thunderbolt storage devices has become quick removal, which is a state where external storage devices can be disconnected without following the safely remove hardware process. But there are inconveniences to switching to quick removal as the default setting. The first is that Windows won't cache disk writes anymore, meaning that data moved to an external storage device might take longer to transfer. Keep external storage devices as better performance. Microsoft will allow users to overwrite the default quick removal state on a per device basis. This is for users who are copying backups to external hard drives or those copying crucial PowerPoint slides or other business documents to a USB memory stick and may want to make sure data transfer both safely, faster, and without any potential problems. After 36 years, the font Helvetica gets a much needed facelift. Everyone has an opinion about fonts but Helvetica has long reigned over the modern era. It's used for brands galore, Panasonic, Jeep, American Airlines, Motorola, 3M, Toyota, just to name a few. But in recent years, tech companies like IBM, Apple, Netflix, and Google have been shifting their custom Helvetica-esque, but not quite fonts to deal with some of its quirks. Rather than let Helvetica die a slow death, all 40,000 characters in the world's most iconic typeface have been revamped into a new font called, well, wait till you hear this, Helvetica Now. This is not a revival. This is not a restoration. The company that owns the licensing rights to Helvetica said in a statement that this is Helvetica Now for everyone, everywhere, for everything. Okay, then let it be said that typeface designers are a dramatic bunch. Some of the issues with Helvetica center around uneven kerning, the spacing between letters, and readability issues at small sizes. That introduces challenges when it comes to meeting modern tech needs, like resizable browser windows and smaller screens. To address those issues, Helvetica now will be available in three sizes, micro, text, and display, according to Monotype. Micro is meant for smaller screens and lower resolutions like what you might find on tablets and smartwatches. 
Meanwhile, display evens out kerning for larger sizes like a billboard, while text is designed for visually crowded environments. Helvetica now comes in three sizes, micro, text, and display. The last time Helvetica was updated was in 1983 with Helvetica Nu, that's N-E-U-E, which is basically the version of font that you're familiar with, and as for how it differs with Helvetica now, aside from sizing, it's mostly minor design tweaks. Changes include clarifying the difference between the lowercase L and a capital I, as well as an updated at symbol. Helvetica now includes a straight leg R, a single story, a lowercase u without a trailing serif, rounder punctuation, and a rounder G. For now, you can explore what the Helvetica now looks like on Monotype's website. It'll take a bit before Helvetica now completely replaces its predecessor. However, companies will still have to license the font from Monotype, and that could take some time. Chances are, unless you're into design or typefaces, you might not even notice any difference at all. Marty Winston has a presentation on water conditioning without salt. He's done a lot of wacky things that make promises that are too good to be true when it comes to household shortcuts. Well, Marty, much to your chagrin, as you move into your new surroundings, I guess you have to find out what you have to do. So what changes will you be making? Hey, have you ever attended a local home and garden show? When you do, you may run into one or two shady exhibitors, the kind who represent a specific class of operations with, in my opinion, not much class at all. Some of them are outright hucksters. I remember coming across one guy who swore that his product could take iron out of hard water without using pellets or chemicals or energy and would last forever. Well, it was a magnet, a simple magnet clamped around the water pipe. Fortunately, I had paid attention in my high school physics and chemistry classes, so I can tell you even now what that thing can really do. It's true, a magnet can attract suspended ferromagnetic particles, things like iron granules in the water. It's also true that if the magnet is strong enough, or the flow is slow enough, or the iron is sparse enough, it would certainly reduce the amount of iron getting through, at least for a while. It's also true that it could keep iron out of your water lines forever, only here's the part they don't tell you about forever. The iron accumulates on that one area of pipe that's closest to the magnet. It keeps accumulating. Let that happen long enough, and the accumulated iron will clog the pipe. Not just clog it, I mean, it it'll block it. No more water will get through ever, with or without iron in it. So that product will indeed stop you from having iron in your water forever because it also stops you from having water forever or at least until you replace the section of pipe with a magnet on it. From time to time we run into products that claim to soften water without using those big heavy bags of salt pellets. Now I got that wrong. They don't claim to soften water, they claim to stop scale buildup and make existing scale go away. Some of them claim to get the same kind of effect of soap suds as softened water, even though it isn't really softened water. One of them that really intrigued me does it with an electronic gizmo using pretty much the same circuitry as an audio sweep oscillator to get the job done. Ready for a surprise? This one really works. Let me take a few seconds to go a little deeper geek and explain how it works. But to keep it simple, I'll just use the term calcium stuff to talk about the teensy chunks in your water supply that end up making scale. They ride along the waterways in your pipes looking for love, which is to say they have unfulfilled chemical bonds that love to stick to things like the inside walls of your pipes or the small holes in your shower head or in the spray head in your dishwasher. They're light enough to get stuck there and accumulate there. The trick is to get those teensy calcium stuff tidbits 
to bond with each other before they get anywhere else. Because when they do, the crystals that result are too big and heavy in that micro mini world to stick to the sides of anything. And with their bonds now satisfied by each other, how romantic, they're no longer looking for the love of pipe walls or spray ports. They just flow through with the water they're in. Officially, it's still hard water because these minerals are still in it, but pragmatically, they're not creating scale like hard water usually does. They're also not offering the open bonds. They don't even have open bonds that make hard water interfere with the action of soap. So you get the same kind of suds and effective washing that you always thought would only happen with softened water. Oh, one more thing. Did you ever make rock candy? It's a crystal that's based on sugar, and when you make it, you do that in a solution of sugar and water, and the crystal grows and grows. Crystals, get it? Just like the dissolved sugar grows the rock candy, any scale that's already there in your plumbing sends its calcium stuff along for the ride with the crystals passing by. The calcium stuff crystals in the water grow, and the scale deposit shrinks. So yeah, this approach also cleans out scale that's already in pipes and plumbing. Depending on how much water runs through a specific pipe and on how much scale is already there, it will take maybe a few months to several months to get the job done. I'm planning a little test at our project house where I intend to replace all the pipes anyway. We'll talk about that another time, but I'll know which are most used and which are least used all in the same plumbing system, all on the same water. So as I cut the pipes out, I'll get a pretty good idea of how much they've cleaned up their act. Then maybe I can stop buying white vinegar or save it for just coffee maker cleanups. So how does an oscillator going woo, woo, woo make calcium stuff cluster into crystals? The oscillator's output feeds a coil that's wrapped around the main water line in your house. A couple of things are at work, and the irony is that one of them is iron, but there are other things happening too. There's a little bit of perturbation, a big word that means shake em up, baby, that creates a little agitation in the water. There's also a little bit of ionization, as the induced electrical field encourages attraction among those looking for love chemical bonds. Just think of it this way. Teensy calcium flotsam in... Bigger calcium stuff crystals out. That's all it really takes. Remember, there are two kinds of water usage to think about in your house. One kind is drinking and cooking water, where you may want to do a lot more purification than I just talked about. What I was just talking about is in the category of wash water, because that's how it's mostly used. Washing, flushing toilets, watering the lawn, and that kind of thing. Fast recap. Most sources of water are hard water, carrying a high grain count of calcium and magnesium and probably other minerals. Water is called hard water when that grain count is high. Softened water is water that's been through a water softener that uses salt, and because the calcium and magnesium have been removed, their grain count is low, so the water is considered soft. But beware that the salt-based softeners end up adding sodium and potassium to the water in your house. Water that's processed through the legitimate salt-free water conditioners, I'm not calling them softeners, water going through those conditioners still has a high grain count, but their calcium stuff has been converted into crystals that don't turn into scale, don't clog your plumbing, and do give you the same kind of soap suds you get with softened water. I found this intriguing salt-free no-tank conditioning gizmo at Home Depot. I followed up on it because I can't imagine Home Depot falling for any kind of huckster gizmo. So I dug in and did my homework. This one is called Scale Blaster. And I was really skeptical going in, but they converted me. Next time, still on plumbing, I'll talk about toilets in ways you may not have considered. In a segment that I call A Straight Flush Beats a Full House. And that's just part of the story. Thank you, Marty. Public service announcements. Computer club meetings in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Tri-State region. The computer clubs have random access sessions at each of these club meetings. If you have any questions or need for technical advice, the club members are more than happy to assist. There is no such thing as a dumb question. 
The Brookdale Computer Users Group has a meeting on April the 25th. Meeting time is 7 p.m. Topic of presentation is Wi-Fi 6, IEEE 802.11ax. The meeting will be held in the Middletown Library Lodge Meeting Room, located at 55 New Monmouth Road in Middletown, New Jersey. Princeton PC Users Group has a meeting on Tuesday, April the 30th. Meeting time is 7 p.m., and they meet at the Mercer County Library in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. The Westchester PC Users Group is meeting Thursday, May the 2nd. Meeting time is 7 p.m. Keller Williams Realty, 120 Bloomingdale Road in White Plains, New York. Amateur Computer Group of New Jersey has a meeting on Friday, May 3rd. Meeting time is 8 p.m., and they meet at the Scotch Plains Rescue Squad, 1916 Bardo Avenue in Scotch Plains, New Jersey. Danbury Area Computer Society has their meeting on Tuesday, May the 7th. Meeting time is 7.30 p.m., and they meet at the Danbury Hackerspace, 158 Main Street in Danbury, Connecticut. New York Amateur Computer Club has their general meeting on Thursday, May the 9th, at NYU 32 Waverly Place, Silver Building, Manhattan, New York. Long Island Macintosh Users Group meet on Friday, May the 10th. Meeting time is 7 p.m. And they meet at the Harry J. Schur Hall, New York Institute of Technology, Old Westbury Campus in Old Westbury, New York. Computer Learning Center of Ewing has a presentation on Apple Seeds and Apple Devices, they meet on Tuesday, May the 14th. Meeting time is 2 p.m. And they meet at the Ewing Senior and Community Center at 999 Lower Ferry Road in Ewing, New Jersey. The King's Bite Computer Club meets Tuesday, May the 14th. Meeting time is 7 p.m. And they meet at the Park Plaza Restaurant, 220 Cadman Plaza West, Brooklyn, New York. If you have a computer club meeting you want me to announce on the air, send me a note. My address is hank at pcradioshow.org. Our website is pcradioshow.org. We can be heard each Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on prn.fm, on the Internet, and podcasts are available from all major pod hosting sites as well as on our website, pcradioshow.org. If you have any questions for us or commentary on any of our feature segments, just send us your email address with your telephone number in which we can call you at a convenient hour for playback on the program. If you have any questions for us, just send us an email address to hank at pcradioshow.org. There is no such thing as a stupid question. In the meantime... Stay in touch and keep on computing, and remember to back up. I'm Hank Key, and on behalf of Joe King and Michael Horowitz, we thank you for listening. Stay safe and healthy until we meet again, same time, same station, next week.